never seen the righteous forsaken. He won't know his seed begging for bread. He won't fail. No, 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 no. He won't fail. Welcome to Shallow Seventh-day Adventist Church, Toronto weekly live stream. To our deaf and hearing impaired audience, we apologize for not having captions. Here at Shallow, we are inclusive, we are resilient, we care about others, we are a faith-based, Bible-believing Christian community, and we love to have fun. We absolutely enjoy making new friends, and we're just seeking to move from pieces to piece one day at a time. And we're doing this by connecting people to our God, our church, our community, and our world. For the year 2024, our focus will be on the world. There's an amazing promise that's found in the Bible. It's found in John chapter 3 and verse 16. And it simply states, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believed in him, should not perish but have eternal life that's an amazing promise and we're seeking to support others where they are by sharing this to the world we extend to you a warm invitation to join us online or in person all are welcome Behold the beauty of our planet. A masterpiece crafted by the hands of the Creator. From the majestic peaks of snow-capped mountains to the gentle embrace of rolling hills. From the tranquil shores of glistening lakes to the rhythmic dance of cascading waterfalls. The Earth reveals the boundless wonders of its design. In the tapestry of existence, every thread tells the story of creation, of order, and of purpose. Shallow, here are your announcements for this week. It's income tax season and your income tax receipts are now available. They are ready for pickup. If you require your income tax receipts to be mailed out to you, then please notify the treasury team. The Renew Prior Journey continues this Sunday at 6 a.m. Join us on Zoom or watch on YouTube. The Shallow Music Department invites you to Jesus the Way the truth and life saturday march 30th starting at 11 a.m see you there are you creative do you enjoy doing behind the scene work editing videos and such then if that's you you're exactly who we're looking for connect with us online or in person vacant posts there's still many vacant posts if you are available or interested in any of these posts then please reach out to our clerk Rwanda, a nature lover's paradise, is known as the land of a thousand hills. It has one of the youngest populations in the world, with the average age being 19 years. Introducing the gospel through education is one way to reach this group. Goma College of Health Sciences at the Goma campus of the Adventist University of Central Africa is situated about 150 kilometers from Kigali, the country's capital. The college offers a bachelor's degree and a diploma in nursing and midwifery. Located at 1,800 meters above sea level and overlooking Kivu Lake, the campus provides a beautiful environment for learning. Where it's located, there are no much distractions. 
When you come here, you know you've come to learn, so you just sit and focus on your studies. Over the years, the school has accepted international students. The college plans to expand and add more courses. With this plan, the school is greatly in need of a new dormitory to house the additional students. Uh, the universities are looking how to run other departments in this campus. And according to the number of the students we have here, we are not able to accommodate them if you add those departments, it will be difficult to us to accommodate all those students. And as we have seen, we are in the village and we are receiving international students. We are those international students, they will not go to stay outside. They need where to stay here. So that's why we need those uh, dormitories here. Offering additional courses will not only benefit the college, but also the surrounding community. An increase in student enrollment will mean more job opportunities for those living in areas nearby. Goma College of Health Sciences of AUCA is a respectable campus and applicants need to have a high passing score on the government issued exams in order to be accepted. Although other educational institutions may be cheaper, more students come to study at the Adventist College because it offers something other schools don't provide. I think Aoka is different from different universities. Here, when you're here, you feel more like uh, a Christian student. And that changes because we come from different families, different backgrounds. We don't get the chances, you know, to be told about the Bible, to be taught about God. And from the name Aoka Adventist University of Central Africa, you really feel that presence of God in their academics. The nursing program is well known because of the highly experienced faculty members. There is a need for a new girls dorm to cater to the many new students enrolling in the program. The good thing is that there are, if it's a nursing institution, there are nurses too. So they know much about nursing. They have experience in nursing. So when they are teaching us, it's like, it's something that they have lived. So it's easier for us to understand and to learn. And they, they really help us get what we came for here. As this school strives toward excellence, please pray for the faculty, students, and staff in Ngoma College of Health Sciences at the AUCA campus. Pray that this school will hold up its Christian values so that more students will come to know Christ. Your support of a new dormitory through the 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will make a difference in their lives. Thank you for supporting Mission.
Good morning, everybody. Those in the building, good morning. Hope you're having a good week. Those who are on the various devices, good morning. I trust that if you don't have to come out, you won't come out, but <laughs> we appreciate it if you come out. <laughs> good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone, to those in the building and those online and those who are on their way coming out because it's a beautiful, sunny morning. And what's your name? Oh, my name is Charmaine, and hello, everyone, again. And my name is... Alfred, and it's our pleasure to be here with you this morning. Yes, it is. Let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. You're such a good God. You're being with us. You promise never leave us, not, never leave us or forsake us. You promise that you'll be with us. We pray now that the Holy Spirit will be with us here in the building, be with those in the, at home and the, the various devices, and help that they will be blessed as we study your words. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Praise the Lord. Okay. And all things work together for good. Yes. Nice title. Acts 8, <laughs> 1 to 8. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I will be reading from the New International Version. Uh, verse 1 goes like this. And, sorry, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word Wherever they went, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Amen. Amen. Okay. Very short, this one. It's short, but it's full of information. It is. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Yes. And you may ask, why would Saul give approval? Why would anybody have to give approval? If people want to do stuff, they will do stuff, isn't that, is that is correct? That is true, yes, they can. Do I keep approval to you to do anything that, that, that you're doing? No, you can't. I can't. <laughs> not, I, I can't. Neither can you give approval to anybody, really. You can say if you they want to do it, it, but if you want to do it, you do it. Yeah. So you. the fact that they said like, uh, Saul gave, gave approval to his death it means that they recognize Paul as the one in charge of them. Yes, and you have to clarify, that's the, the last verse in chapter okay. 7. Go, go, go just wanted, no, I just want to let you know, because in chapter 8 it started off different, but that's mm. the last phrase in chapter 7, mm -hmm. yes, and it continues. Okay. Right, yes. and the fact that, God, that Paul was given approval means that Paul could have stopped if he wanted. He could have, he could have said, no, don't go that far, that just, just rough him up, but he did not. And during this whole discourse in Acts, we have never heard about the Romans coming in to do anything. No, we have not. It's all about the temple, the Sadducees, and all the other people that are making up these, um, deciding what to do. The Romans have not intervened whatsoever. So all the government, government wanted was to be you to pay your taxes yes. and to do not cause a disturbance. Yes. That's Remember that. With Paul and with even with Jesus, they accused them of causing a disturbance. Okay. The Roman government didn't care who you worship. No, they did not. They didn't. As long as you pay your taxes. Yes. And kept yourself busy doing yeah. whatever you need to do, but just, you know, leave it. Yeah. So Paul gave approval. Yes. Oh, no. Saul. Saul, yeah. So I'll give, so I'll give approval. approval, sorry. Yes. <laughs> right through this narrative, there's a shift coming. And the shift is coming from worship using sacri the sacrificial system and 
It's just accepting Jesus Christ. Yes, and there was a pushback because that means everything that they've been doing will change, and they don't want to change anything. They want to keep things the way it is. So they were very angry because I remember there was a preceding verse where they were saying they were angry and they gnashed their teeth. They were really mad at what was going on. And prior to that, they were they'd put the disciples in jail. They'd beaten them. They'd warned them, but the disciples still would not stop doing it. And Stephen's... Um, speech before he died was amazing and it should have been life altering, life changing, but they were not listening. They were just angry. And what Saul didn't know is that he was going to be part of the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel. I won't get oh. into it now. Okay. The 70 weeks prophecy ended on AD 34 after Stephen was Stoned. stoned and that was supposed to be the end of the Jewish nation as we know it then being being a part of God's um, chosen people okay no 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 it's behind the long to everybody everybody's included okay. yes but but Saul didn't know that no he did not and so on that day a great persecution broke out mm -hmm. how could persecution break out when you have religious bodies in play. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, first of all, I always wonder, like, uh, being a religious person, you know, in the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. And he approved of the killing and the stoning. So they were not listening to the Holy Spirit at the time. They were doing things on their feelings, mm -hmm. on what they thought was right. I don't hear any says, and they went and consulted the, the holy leaders like the last time, and mm. they had a council, and they decided what to do. It didn't say that. It said they laid their coats, and Paul Hol Saul Hole held it, mm. and then they stoned him. So no, there was no part in the scripture that said they prayed and asked God, what shall we do with these people? Mm. Nothing was said there, just that. A great persecution broke mm. out, Charmaine. Mm -hmm. We have two religious bodies, mm -hmm. and persecution broke out. Yes. It, the government wasn't involved in this. No, the government was not involved. But persecution does break out. But that happened in, in the past. There's lots of other times where religious people fight against each other. It happens all the time, unfortunately. So then our focus usually is on what the government is doing, even okay. now. We look towards the government, and the government can bring in the Sunday law, and this and that, and that, that, that. Persecution broke out with two religious bodies. It did. Is this that what's going to happen again? Yes. Yes, it is going to happen Our again. problems are not without. Our problems are within. Yes. It's within. Because we don't, again, there was no, let's pray to God and ask him what to do. Let's fast and pray. There was mm. nothing of that. They took matters into their own hand. And we're supposed to be consulting God on everything we do. Mm. He says he wants everything from us. And that didn't happen in the first verse. For those who don't, well, at the beginning, we are in Acts 8. We're doing 1 to 8. Mm -hmm. We're in verses, still in verse 1. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Yes. All except the apostles. Yes. Why wasn't the apostles scattered? <laughs> you know what? In Acts chapter 1, mm -hmm. verse 8, I believe it mm -hmm. is, to God, sorry, Jesus had said, you're going to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, mm -hmm. and Samaria. So there's the they were opportunity. In, they were in, um, they were in um, Jerusalem. They were in Jerusalem. So the apostles stayed in Jerusalem they did. to preach the gospel yes. there. And remember, it says that in Samaria and Judea, the gospel was supposed to be preached there too, yes. in the, from Acts 1. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so and to the end of the earth. Yep. Yeah. So the fact of preaching the gospel, you shall preach. God didn't say if it was mandatory <laughs> or if it was co coincidentally. No. Jesus didn't say that. No, he didn't. He just said it will be. You will As testify. they were persecuted, they went. Yes. So matter, no matter where they are, they, they, they were witnesses. They were. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any 
excuses for being witnesses. No, no we don't. Or not being also, witnesses. Also, you have to remember, I mean, this, now they're, I don't want to say forced, now they, they are, because of what's happening, they are now going out into the different mm. regions mm -hmm. and doing what God had already told them that they, mm. that they would be doing. Mm. It's unfortunate that it happened that way. It would have been great if, you know, people would listen and you could continue, but sometimes this is still, God is still within this, whatever context, yeah. whatever is happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just, unfortunately, that um, death has to occur and people have to be placed in jail. But it didn't say that they went out sorrowful and they were nope. afraid or they were ashamed. They went out and they spoke anyway. They knew they had to go, so they went and they said, well, you're not listening. We're going over there to talk. So the Bible didn't say that they stopped the prayer. No, it said and that they And to complain that they were being persecuted. No, they did not complain. What do we do most of the time? We complain, we complain first. Or we have meetings on strategies how we're going and to we do this. And we pray for deliverance. That Yes, we do. We, yeah, because if I'm being persecuted, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Well, I thought that way. I would be praying, Lord, please don't let this happen to me. You know, but they did not do that. They left and they went and they preached. So then the question comes in then, what is God's will for Alfred Knight? What's God's will for Sherman? What's God's will for you? Some of the gospel don't look good to us. Persecution, it doesn't look good. No, persecution <laughs> does not look good. In fact, I was really amazed how Stephen, in what, the way it was said, seemed so calm. And yeah. he also asked them, God to forgive them because they're misguided. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't saying, Lord, deliver me. He was just saying, Lord, I'm coming into mm -hmm. your hands. Mm -hmm. Take me. Um, so it makes us see... We have to change our perspective about how we act when we are going through as what we call persecution. We call it, and uh, I think it was two, two quarters ago, the crucible. Crucible. Okay. The crucible is there to take off our rough edges, yes. to put us in a position to look up. But we don't want crucibles, as I said before, we pray to get out of crucibles. We do. We call, as I said before, we call Barbados. We call Jamaica for people to pray for us. We call England. We call Africa. We call USA for people to pray for us. Get out, get us out of crucible. Yes. But if it's God ordained, what right do I have to pray out of your crucible when your crucible is God ordained? You don't have. Well, you know what. <laughs> Reading this now, when, when we pray, we have to ask God to give us the strength yep. to endure Thank what is very. happening to us as opposed to take us out of what's happening to us. I like that. Um, I remember when we, there was a sermon when the person said that they prayed, they thank God for having cancer, and mm. I was thinking, what? How can you do that? But they prayed and they thanked God, and um, they had the strength to deal with it. They were able to witness the people, and their mannerism was totally different than a person in woe and, oh, no, look at me. They were, they were more willing to tell people about how God is good, and despite what's happening to me, mm -hmm. I can, they could see the blessings and the different things that was enriching their lives. So mm -hmm. we have to learn to be that way because persecution will come. Our crucibles will come in our way, but we need to ask God again to give us the strength because he said he's not going to leave us. He didn't say he would necessarily take it away. He said he won't leave us mm -hmm. and he won't forsake us. So, so the word comes to mind, one word, and that word is contentment. Yes. We have to have contentment. Yes. And contentment is not based on just good times. It's based on every time. Yes. Be contented because we're looking ahead to a day when all this would be done away with. That is so No true. more sickness, no more sorrow, no more sadness, yes. no more death. Yes. Be contented now. So content, contentment is accepting your position that God has placed you in. Yes. It's like God. And still being be joyful. a witness. I mean, be, being <laughs> joyful. Yes. Okay. We're going to do two because I thought that was also yes, very ahead. interesting. And it says in number two, some devout, devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they didn't even, the, the, the early church, they didn't bury Stephen. Other people buried Stephen. They yep. were leaving. They were being 
put in jail, they were being harassed, and they didn't bury them. And you know, you're supposed to bury them the next day, as soon as possible. Yeah. Mm. Others had to do, to bury them. So I'm asking you, how did, can you explain that part? Godly men. Mm-hmm. They're godly people that we don't see, that might not even acknowledge at that time that they're godly. Because it's a transitionary period that people are going through. Mm-hmm. They're they, they heard Stephen's speech, yes. and their heart was changed. That is true. But yes. they weren't the ones that people recognize as, like yes. the apostles and, yes. and the, the other leaders who f- had, to, had to flee. That's true. So even at Stephen's death, Stephen's death produced godliness yes. in people. Yes, and more witnesses, too. More witnesses. Also... Um, when I was reading, they, the disciples, ap- apostles, mm-hmm. used to preach around the temple area. Mm-hmm. And um, people would be coming into worship, and some would stop and listen to them, right? Mm-hmm. So they were having a change of heart, too. And they were not um, for what had happened to Stephen. They were angry. And you're not supposed to mourn someone when they die that way. Mm-hmm. But they were saying, this is not right. We are not supposed to do this. So people were speaking up, but the ones who were being persecuted had to leave. Yeah. And this is, but Saul began to destroy the church. And when you read that quickly, you miss a very important point. Mm-hmm. And Saul, under the auspices of the temple church. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the council had agreed church, that it was okay for him Sanhedrin to Sanhedrin. Yes. Began to destroy the church. Yes. But I thought that they were the church. They, again, <laughs> the establishment was being shaken up now because there's a new way of doing things, mm. not like the old sacrificial way. And mm. they did not want their power to be taken away. And remember, they've been threatening the, the apostles saying, you don't, don't talk about Jesus. You're not supposed to do this. Stop it. Mm-hmm. And no matter what they did, the apostles would not listen. So now they're angry and it's like, it's like we're going to do something about it. You've, you've done, this is the last straw. We're done with you now. We're going to take matters into our own hands and we're going to fix this problem. So the way it's written, Charmaine, you're very right, by the way. The way it's written is that God's church, destroyed the church, is quite different from the temple church. Yes. Quite different than maybe like the church. Yes. Also, the the ones who are fleeing realize that you don't necessarily need a building Mm. to serve God. Because they went to another place where there was no temple Mm. and they were preaching the gospel. So the people who started to persecute the church are the same ones who made all these rules and regulations. Yes. Above what God has given. God gave 10 commandments and they, I think they had a, a lot. A lot. Quite over a 100 commandments <laughs> they that they made. It was a lot. And they were breaking their commandments and also God's God commandments. Yes. Thou shalt not kill. Yes. What did they do? They were putting them in jail. And, and also, it also said women as well. Like, it wasn't just the men that they were taking and putting in jail or persecuting. It was women and men. They did not, they were not discriminating. So then, were, everybody was being... Everybody was. So, yes. the fact that you're taking women to mm-hmm. who were not leaders. Yes. The women weren't, weren't the leaders no, in that weren't. day. It's no. not like now. No. The women weren't leaders. They had no disrespect. So the question then is that, what motivated them? And you'll see when you go into verse 4. Okay, so verse 4 says, But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. So they were preaching. Yes, they were preaching and teaching. And they didn't want the preaching. No. Remember this? About Jesus. Yeah, about Jesus. You can preach, but don't preach about Jesus. This problem started when Peter healed the man in front of the temple. Yes. Remember, that's, what, that, that's where this discussion yeah. started. Yes. And they told them not to preach. Yes. And they, they were they, very clear. They, they didn't tell them not to heal. No, they said don't preach. Do not preach in yes. that name. Yes. They wouldn't even call his, his name. No, they did not. So the problem is they themselves didn't recognize Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So if they didn't recognize Jesus Christ, who did they recognize? Again, 
they did not want to lose their status. Yeah, but who did it recognize? They if it's not Jesus, who is it? They didn't recognize it's Jesus. Satan. They did not recognize Jesus. And yeah. they wanted the followers to denounce that Jesus was Lord. They so if you're doing the work that Satan does or will do, then you are a follower of Satan. If only if you're doing his work, you have followed Satan. If I am doing the work that Satan does, then you're a follower of Satan. Being a follower of Satan doesn't mean you don't go, you, you, you don't go to church. No. You, you might be the earliest in church, but it doesn't mean that you're not a follower of Satan. And that is why we need to be asking Jesus every single day to order our steps in his word, in his way. And that's why they should have actually said, let's go and pray and ask God what we should do. But they didn't do that. And remember the, the verse before, the chapter before, which was about the Holy Spirit. Yes. And they, the, the, the apostles and, the, mm -hmm. and the, the believers who fleed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were. So the, the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit is very, very, very important. Yes. And you also have to remember, too, um, now they were, I don't want to say, I want to say they, were, they weren't going to the different regions that Jesus had, had told them that they were going. But now yeah. they, they were going. They, they had to leave. They had to leave. And they went to Judea and Samaria. So the, what Jesus had said that you would do is now coming into fruition. They are now leaving Jerusalem and they're going to Judea. They're scattering to Samaria and, they're, and they went. And as they're going, they're telling everybody about Jesus. They're not afraid they to were, tell everybody They about were Jesus. forced out. They were. We, a lot of us here came from the Caribbean. We weren't forced out. No. <laughs> but, but because we're here, mm -hmm. what are we doing? Mm -hmm. We are. What, are we, what is our complaints? What is our obstacles? Why, why we not preaching the gospel, is it the color of a person's skin that's stopping from preaching the God's word? There's nothing that can stop us from preaching There's God's nothing word. That can we stop are very us. fortunate. We're in a, a country where we don't have to, you know, hide in, in little places to tell them about Jesus. We can, look, we're online telling people about Jesus. So there's no obstacle in our way. We are our own obstacles. Yeah. So God orchestrated this. Yes. This, this being forced out was God orchestrated. Mm -hmm. And God is the great orchestra director, the director. Yes. Yes. Orchestra director, you have the clarinets, you have the flutes, you have the cello, you have the violins, you have the bass. And he tells them when to come in and how soft to come in, how loud to play. God is the great orchestra director. There was a quote that, as I was reading all these things, that says mm -hmm. sometimes we have to be shaken out of our comfortable state before we do what God wants us to do. So they were somewhat comfortable, mm -hmm. but now with persecution, they had to, like, we have to go. Mm -hmm. What I liked, though, was that they didn't think, so excuse me, <clears throat> they didn't think, oh, where are we going to go? Mm -hmm. It was just, we have to go. And as they were going, we're still going to tell. We're not stopping, and we're not going to be quiet. We're so still going to tell as we who go. Does, who does that remind you of? I'll tell you. Abraham. Abraham? Abraham, he left a place like he didn't know... No, Abraham, that's true. He, Abraham didn't did, he didn't know where he, where he was no, going. He just he just went. God said, God said go. to leave, and he did. Yes. You know, so if we allow God to direct our lives, our lives will be much more happier, much more successful. Yes, and He can and will use our lives in the way He wants. We have to be obedient. Remember, mm -hmm. we learned that we have to be obedient to His will. Mm -hmm. And to be obedient, it means we have to be reading this more diligently, yeah. so that we know, and we have to consult him because no one said, "Hey, apostles, let's have a meeting and figure out where we're gonna, what we're going to do. What's no. the plan?" No, they just left, and they started preaching because before you only heard the apostles preaching, but now you hear the lay people preaching as well. They were listening, they learned, and now they are spreading the word as well. And so Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Yes. Now Samaria is. Samaritans were despised by the Jews. They were. But Samaritans were Jews. They were. <laughs> they were Jews back then who did dabble in idol worship mm -hmm. and also God worship. 
Yes. Did it says dabble. here, Samaritans were descendants of the northern kingdom of Israel and foreigners that the Assyrians moved into the land. And if you do read 2 Kings 17, 24, you, will, you can find out more. Jews did not associate with the Samaritans. It's possible Philip has, had less of a problem because he was a Hel Hellenistic Jew. He grew up in a Greek culture, mm -hmm. so it was easier for him. So he wasn't, uh, he didn't have racist tendency towards the Samaritans. He yeah. was just doing what God told him to do, go and preach and spread. So the same people that the Jews despised were the ones God was yes. going to use yes. to preach yes. his message. Yes. And now when Jesus died, he was saying, this is for everyone. This is not just for one set of people. The door is open for everybody. So now mm -hmm. the, Samar the Samaritans were going to be told that this is for you. And it also was predicted when Jesus had seen the woman at the well, and he said, it will be for everyone. And now yep, they're, for they're everyone. coming. Because yeah. remember, she ran and told everybody, look, I met a man. So now everybody's going to hear and know about yeah. this. So when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. Yes. They paid close attention to what they he did. said. Yes, they did. They weren't confused by what happened before. No. They weren't. No. They were, con they were paying attention to what he said. Yes. God's word will change hearts. Yes, it does. It does change hearts. Yes. And if you want to get people's attention to God, you have to speak his words. Yes, his words. His words. His words, that's true. Not your opinion, so, so not the, your thoughts, the fact, his words. <laughs> if there was a newspaper, the headline would have been, Jews forced out of Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> but them being forced out, they make the news. What make the news was what? Great joy, I like that one. <laughs> when Philip spoke. Yes. That made them news. Yes. See, so with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Yes. So it's evident then that with Christ being there, yes. good things happen. Yes. Isn't it interesting, though? There is persecution in Jerusalem, mm. but there's great joy in, in Samaria. In Jerusalem, too, eh? <laughs> there's great joy. What I'm just saying is interesting, right? Yeah. And one thing I wanted to remember was the end result was for the glory of God because the persecution simply served to spread the gospel. Yeah. That's what it did, yeah. So, so there is joy in persecution. <laughs> there can be joy in persecution. So my last statement, sure means that we can't, you, don't you, I can't, you can't, we can't use our circumstances as an excuse for not witnessing. Okay? No, we can't. We can't, we can't. There's no excuse. We just need to be obedient. And the last one is, don't pray yourselves out of your circumstances. Yes. Don't pray yourself out of your circumstances. What, what, what you said earlier? Pray for strength Pray for as strength you go through to go your through circumstances. Your circumstances. Yes. I agree maybe with you. your circumstances. My cause were, changes. Are, were, uh, yeah, but and God ordained. God ordained. That is true. Yes. What is your circumstances? Is it God ordained? Give God a chance. Amen. Please enjoy the rest of the service.
Sabbath, everyone. I hope everybody has had a great week. I know the weather has been really, really bad, but I'm so happy to see everybody in the house of the Lord today. So today I will be doing the morning announcements. Um, so for today, I have that next Sabbath, March 30th. It is music day here at Shiloh. So please come out, bring a friend, and let's celebrate Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. So I hope to see everybody there. Also next Sabbath, we will be taking in food items uh, into the community for Easter holiday. We are asking everyone as much as you can to help the community by donating food items to the pantry, such as canned goods, dry goods, baby food, hygiene products, and a list of other items which will be posted in the Shiloh update. So please look out for that. Uh, we can also donate grocery gift cards of which they can use uh, for perishables such as meats, fruits and vegetables. On Friday, April 5th, uh, the Difficult Conversation series will continue and it starts at 7 p.m. Please make sure to stay tuned for that. Um, we also have on Sabbath, April 6th, the next day, will be the prayer and fasting session. This will be on Zoom starting at 4 p.m. Okay, so I hope to see everybody there as well. We also have the communion service, which will be on Sabbath, April 27th, starting at 9 a.m. with foot washing um, ordinance. Okay, everyone? So I hope to see everybody at communion service as well. And we also have this Sunday, March 24th, the Renew Prayer Journey continues. So the dynamic pastor Sterling Thompson of the Bahamas will deliver a powerful message of hope based on Dr. Paul's um, book, 10 Prayers of Faith for Tough Times, 10 Prayers um, Examining Nehemiah's Winning Strategies. So I hope to see everybody online on Sunday as well to stay tuned for that. And be sure to check out our weekly bulletin as well as we have other Shiloh updates for more information. And I hope that everybody has a wonderful worship experience. Thank you. to each and every one of us. Um, will the congregation please stand? It says here, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be above all the earth. For this we have been called to worship. You may be seated. We will sing our call to worship song. It says, it's a new song. We'll be singing it every Sabbath moving forward. It says, glory to your name. It's simple, just repeating, glory to your name forever you your name remains the same we worship and adore you we bow ourselves before you giving you the glory that 
that is due your name. Library inside this wonderful book called the Bible. We are Tuppy, Gumbo, and Freckles. Holy tells us lovely stories from the Bible every day. Come on, guys, let's sing a song for Holy. was a lovely song. Thank you, Holy. We really look forward to your stories. Can you please, please tell us one? Yes, I will. But you have to pay attention. We promise to pay attention, Holy. All right, children. The story I'm about to tell you today is about Solomon turning away from God. King Solomon, the son of David, had become very rich. But though he was rich, he always managed to spend more than he had. So he would be forced to borrow from others. Then to pay back the money he had borrowed, he would tax his people heavily. When he needed workmen, he sent his officials to bring men to work as his slaves. And he always refused to pay them. Solomon was slowly turning away from God. Solomon had many wives during his lifetime. His wives were from many different countries, so they prayed to different gods and had their own religions. Instead of teaching them about his religion, Solomon made temples for each of their gods and eventually started praying to them too. All this made God very sad. He said to Solomon, I thought 
you would stay faithful to me till the end, just like your father. But since you have broken the laws of the commandments, I will take everything away from you. For the sake of David, none of this will happen in your lifetime, but will happen in your son's life, and you will have only one try. And so, just as God had said, when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, became the next king, he faced many problems. That's so sad. I'd really like Solomon. I know. Money can sometimes change a person. So I hope you paid attention. The question is, for whose sake did God tell Solomon that nothing bad would happen in his lifetime? Oh, I know, I know, Holy. It was Rehoboam, right? No, Gumbo. It was David. You must pay more attention. So, till next time. Bye-bye. Happy Sabbath and good morning, Shiloh. I'm Dean McLean. I'm going to do the after reading and prayer this morning. At this time, our deacon and deaconess will stand. Stand in their position. Collect today's tithes and offering. Return our tithes and, and giving our offering is a genuine reward. Part of worship. Honor the Lord with your wealth as the first charge on all your hearing. Let us pray. Kind and loving Father, truly we want to thank you, Lord, for taking us here this morning safely. Father, as we are about to lift an offering, Lord, to further your works here on earth, we ask that you will continue to bless, bless it, Lord, and Help that we may use it for that cause. Father, we ask that you will bless each and every one, those who have to give and those who don't have to give. Help that we receive that blessings, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Church. The scripture reading will be taken from 1 Corinthians 19 to 21. Please stand. 
chapter 1. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thrive. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish of the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the fully of what we preach to save those who believe. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. no time for prayer. Greetings to you all in the mighty name of Jesus and happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be in the house of God another time. It could have been long gone, but he has given us the privilege to be back here to worship and adore his holy name. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we have to forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, we gather in your presence today with open hearts and minds ready to worship and praise your holy name. We ask that you bless this time of worship so that we will be uplifted and inspired by your presence. Fill us with your love and grace and help us to honor you, honor you in all we do and say. May our worship be pleasing to you and may we be transformed by the power of your spirit. <clears throat> I plead, dear God, I place this sick and shatin under your care and humbly ask that you restore your servants to health again. Above all, Greek, grant us the grace to acknowledge your will and know that whatever you do, you do for the love of us. Bless the one who will bring forth your word to your people. Let these words be a blessing as they are imparted to us. And let us not leave this place without the blessing you have in store for us. Continue to be with us as we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, Shiloh. It's a little cold outside today, and we got the white stuff, but we got to be grateful. Amen? We have to be grateful yes. because we've yes. had a wonderful winter. Amen? Yes, amen. And we're here again on another blessed Sabbath day to just worship the Lord. And the Bible says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise when? The dead in Christ shall rise when? And those who are alive will be caught up. And as seventh-day Adventists, this is what we believe. Amen? So today we will sing some hymns. Is that all right with you? Take out your hymnals. They're in the back of your benches. We're going to do some good old Adventist hymns today. And I'd like to hear all the voices in the house sing with us. Amen? So our first hymn. 212. Then we're going to move on to 604 into 214 and 26. 
Acts 2. It's going to be on the screen so you can follow along.
604. We know not the hour of when Christ will come again. So we must and we have to and remain ready. Amen. notes but I, I need to give you a break right <laughs> okay so we'll take it down a little bit okay once again we're gonna get the right key so everyone can sing comfortably is that all right Sure. 
have this hope that burns within our heart. It's the hope of the coming of Christ with everything that's happening in this world. We wonder when, but we just have to be ready and keep on trusting and remaining in that hope that one day he will return. We have this hope all together. We we have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We There's a sweet, sweet spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. In this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. 
job well done. I want to thank them. Lift my spirit heaven bound. I, I don't know, but I'm feeling good this morning. Has God been good? And all the time? I, I want to thank the pastor for Allow me to use the, the pulpit today. I've, I've been to Shiloh. I've been here for the last 10 years. And this is my first opportunity. So I want to thank God for that. <laughs> oh. That's, that seems kind of funny to the pastor. <laughs> Um, I, I, I learned of a story this week um, of a, a family, a, a mother and a daughter who was, was doing some spring cleaning. And it's springtime, so soon we'll be doing spring cleaning. So the little girl, the little girl saw um, a Bible that has always been open on the center table. So in the cleaning, the little girl says, Mom, I don't think we need that book. And the mother said, No, we need it. That's the Lord's book. So being as young and innocent as she was, she, she thought about it and she thought about it. And then she came back to her mother and said, Mom, I think we should give the Lord his book <laughs> because nobody here uses it. <laughs> Today, my sermon is about smartphones, Google, and artificial intelligence. These three entities has been taking the world by storm. So as we, we talk today, I hope that the message will come clear and God will get all the glory. As a scripture reading that was read this morning, 1 Corinthians 1, 19 to 21, in the King James Version, it says this, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And verse 21 says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by the wisdom know not God. In other words, Paul to the Corinthian church was saying, the wisdom of this world will lead you not to know God. But he end, ended the verse by saying, it pleases God 
by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And he used the word foolishness, but we know the gospel is no foolishness. Do you agree with me? Yes. But, but to the wise men of this world, they believe the gospel is foolishness. But it pleases God that the foolishness of preaching will save them that believe. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are here in one accord. You promised where two or three are gathered, you will be right in the midst. So, Father, we're asking you, I'm asking you to use me one more time. Your people are waiting on a word. Let every word that cometh out of my mouth would be with your approval, your your, the meditation of my heart would be accepted in your life. In Jesus' name I pray. In, in 1926, during an interview for Collier Magazine, the legendary scientist and inventor Nikola, Lo, uh, Nikola Tesla described a piece of technology that will revolutionize the lives of its users. And here's this quote. It says, when wireless is perfectly applied, the whole earth will be con converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is. All things being particular in a, in a real and rhythmic whole, we shall be able to communicate with one another instantly, irrespective of distance. Not only this, but through television and the telephone, we shall, we shall see and hear one another as perfectly as though we were face to face. This was in the 1920s. Despite of interpreting in Preventing distance of thousands of miles. The instrument through which we, sh we should be able to do this will be amazingly simple compared to the present telephone. In 1929, do you know that, that rotary phone, the one that they will put the cord to their ears? So Nikola Tesla says it will be amazingly simple, a man will be able to carry one in his vest pocket, 1929. He continued by saying, in just a few decades after Nicola made that comment, mobile phone has gone from a luxury reserved only for the elite to an essential tool for billions of users. From the first in-car phone in the 1940s to the best smartphones of today, the evolution of cell phones is nothing short of remarkable. Isn't it remarkable? After the Second World War, a company, American company by the name of Bell Labs began working on an in-car system, allowing users to place call from anywhere. This led to the Mobile Telephone Service, or MST, launching in 1946, or the first ever wireless telephone system. So the first wireless telephone system that was, um, was accessed to, by the everyday man was a car phone. Do you remember the car phone? All right. I see they have some elderly people here. <laughs> Bell, Bell, Lab, Bell, Bell Laboratories, which is the same Bell Canada today, same company, Bell Labs car phone equipment weighed 80 pounds. 80 pounds in its first generation. And even with all that weight, you could only use it in, in major U.S. cities and along 
selective highways. Despite these limitations, the service quickly gained popularity. It became so popular that the service quickly reaches its maximum capacity due to the limit radio channels available at each base station. Users would have to wait in line for a channel to become available. <laughs> you, you know, I, I remember as a little boy, um, back in the islands, we had cable and wireless. And to make an overseas call, you'd have to go to cable and wireless office. And they put you in a little boot. And, and, and then they place the call for you. The operator will place the call for you. And then you will hear the operator talking to the person you want to talk to. And then they say, OK, go ahead. You could, you could talk. You remember that? Anybody remember that? We, we, we've come a long way, right? <laughs> After decades of research and development, Motorola unveiled the world's first cell phone prototype in 1973. Martin Cooper, the, mobile en Mot sorry, the Motorola engineer who led the development in this invention, invited reporters to witness the first ever wireless phone call. He then proceeded to ring his direct rivalry, Joel S. Engel, of Bell Labs from the streets of New York. It seems like that's, that was a long time ago, but that's just the other day. You, you know, I, I, I really dig really far to get some of these pictures. <laughs> you, you, you remember the, the first one on, on top? The first phone? It was a big Motorola phone. <laughs> It didn't take long, long for more companies to follow in Motorola's footsteps. Nokia, for example, entered the cell phone market in 1987 with the, Mo the Mobile Cityman 900. The phone weighed 1.6 pounds. A vast difference, right? A vast difference. And it says, Another year later, Samsung released its first ever cell phone in 1988 with the SH-100. The, the 90s marked the time of a rapid change in cell phone industry, particularly with the release of a smaller and more portable device, but arguably, the most important development of this decade was the global system of mobile communication. The first fully digital cell phone standard. In 1991, GSM efficiently was perceived as a necessary advancement as the existing analog network rapidly approached maximum capacity. These days, you don't even hear about the analog system. I had a friend that said to me the other day, you know, I wish I had an analog phone. I said, it wouldn't be used to you because there's no system to run the analog phone. It's just outdated. It's only in our memories now. In the early 2000s, the, um, I, the iPhone came to, to being. The decade saw a rise of a fully colored LCD display and multimedia feature like the audio, audio playback. Phones could also access the internet at faster speed via the GSM base. Sony and Ericsson made its first phone to include Bluetooth connectivity as early as 2001. Now, you see that phone on the screen? I remember, I remember a friend of mine came back from the States, and he bought a phone like that, and I bought it from him. We, we had a company um, by the name of Airtel back then. But those were the days when you used, to, you used to pay for incoming and pay for outgoing, pay for text message. So 
I, I put a hundred dollars on my, my phone. I put it the Monday morning. And by the Wednesday, the phone said I have no, <laughs> no money. I put another hundred dollars. And by the Friday, I had no money. I remember going into the office and complaining that there's something wrong with this phone. And then the lady gave me a bill that went down like this. <laughs> Every time the phone rang, money came off. But I'm happy that we passed that stage as well. <laughs> In uh, 2007, Apple entered the, the cell phone market with the iPhone. The company announced it as a revolutionary mobile phone. It was a widescreen iPad with touch control and a, break, uh, a breakthrough to internet communication device. Um, so you could say, I don't like to say it, I don't have an iPhone, but you could say iPhone changed the market. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. How many devices do you think the iPhone, or sorry, the cell phone, the smartphone, really replace? How many, how many devices that you don't have to work with anymore? Ten. ten. I hear ten. But let's look at it. The, the, the cell phone replaced, um, anytime now, almost 50 devices. Almost 50 devices. For some reason, man found a way for us to have a device that we just can't do without. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere. So now, you really can't leave home without it. And I, I'm going to put it to you that there's two reasons why you can't leave your phone home. The first reason uh, is because you'll be lost. You will no longer remember nobody's phone number. You know, a time ago, I, I, had, I, I knew at least 20 numbers out of my head. And now, without my phone... I can't, even, I can't even call. The second reason, your spouse might just got their, get their hands on it. And that might not be a good, a good thing either. So, so don't leave home without it. Don't leave home without it. <laughs> so now, it brings me to another another group, and this is Google. So now scientists has us having a device that we can't put down. Literally, literally, we have to beg our children, please put it down. It's not stuck in your hands. Am I, am I the only one that's having this problem? So now let's look at Google. Google Google was found on September 4th, 1998, by an American computer scientist, Larry Page, and Sergey Brown, while they were PhD students in Stanford University in California. Google have large, large warehouses, like Amazon warehouse. You ever seen an Amazon warehouse? Yeah. They have large warehouse with the capacity to take to store every information that there is. So back in the day, we used to have a set of books called the encyclopedias. <laughs> Google make that dormant. Google is able, any, any information that's out there, good, bad, and indifferent, Google found it a way to store it and it's right at your fingertips. So now you have a device you can't leave home without, and you have all the information that you need right at your fingertips. Amen. 
So I'm, I'm waiting on my tech guy. Yeah. So this is just a, a look at inside of one of Google's warehouse. Where, where, where when they say that your, your information is stored in the cloud, it looks like, like this in the background. But there's a big question. It's a big question. And it might, found, it might sound as a funny question, but it's actually been debated around, uh, around the internet today. Here's the question. Is Google God? It's a big question. It might not be something that you engage in, but there are people that have been engaged in this conversation that Google is now all-knowing. Matter of fact, as Christians, are we relying on Google more than God? Think about it. Think about it. Are you relying on Google more than God? There are people that, that's actually moving away from God and going to Google. I mean that normally, by faith, we would kneel and pray and ask God for certain questions, certain questions to get certain answers. That's what they teach us, and that's how our faith should work. But now, we find it so much easier just go to Google, and Google might give you the answer that, that you want. Might just give you the answer that you want. So the question people are finding out, or people are saying, or suggesting, that Google knows everything. Google knows everything. So let's, let's go back at it. Look at it. They found a device that you can't leave home without. And then they equipped it with Google that is all-knowing, or so they say, all-knowing. Follow me, I'm going somewhere with this. Then they introduce something else. They're introducing artificial intelligence, or better known as AI. There's three types of artificial intelligence. First, you have the artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI. It's, it's stage one. What that does, it gives you stuff like CV and Alexa, which is one device in your house that you could ask anything that is equipped with Google. Then you have stage two, which is AGI, which is Artificial General Intelligence. If you look at the bottom, it says, it refers to a computer that is as smart as a human across the board. Then you have stage three, which is ASI, which is artificial super intelligence. And then look at the bottom again, it says, an intelligence that is much smarter than the best human brain in particular any field, in any field. I'm wondering if I'm the only person that heard this. Yesterday on the news, um, I heard that Toronto is going to use AI, I'm, I'm hearing it, you heard it. So to Toronto now is going to use AI to help the congestion in the traffic. They're going to set up some, some, some smart um, sensors and, and uh, stoplights that detect traffic and help the flow of traffic. So coming out of downtown just now is not going to be so, um, so hard, <laughs> so difficult. Today, AI is all around us. You find AI in, in financial applications, in your everyday application, 
you find AI in education, in e-commerce. There's so when you go on a shopping website, there's AI in the back, just looking at what you're looking at. Have you ever noticed like when when you when you go maybe to Amazon and you press uh, balloons, automatically they keep sending you balloons and different balloons and different balloons. That's the artificial intelligence behind basically giving you exactly what you, you're looking for. So everywhere in our society now, they're using AI. So I, I'm, I'm throwing this out that, uh, that the AI department or some department, we need to have more conversations with what's going on in AI. You have AI pets. AI is making its way into your homes um, at a rapid pace. Um, the AI pets is amazing. You have a dog that you will never have to buy food for. <laughs> you will never have to take it to the vet. You will, you will never have to take it for a walk. And most of all, you can ask it anything and it will answer you. That's where we're going now with, with AI. But being honest, I've, I've seen this before. I've seen this, this way of the wisdom of humans coming to a, 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 a level that kind of pushed God out the way. But let's look at the story. Let's, 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 let's try to follow it from the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis told us that it was perfect. Where God himself would come down and walk with Adam. The garden was perfect. Everything was perfect. Sin showed up. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, the earth was fully populated. But God used the word that he repented, he made in man because the wisdom was so high by that time, they didn't want God anymore. So he had the flood. From the flood, how many persons survived? Eight. That's Genesis 6. By Genesis 11, the earth was populated again. But now, they turned to a different disaster. Just waiting to, to come up on the screen. By Genesis 11, the earth got populated and they started building the Tower of Babel. You see, the point I'm trying to make with you is that every time the wisdom of man starts to explore into ways that we don't understand, they trample on God's territory. The wisdom of man, after you have reached so high, the only other thing else is to start to go into God's territory. So Genesis 11, 9 says, Therefore, the name of it was called Baal. We know the story. They decided that they're going to build a, 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 a tower that will go up to God himself. But there was somebody else that was up by God that said, I want to put my throne in his place. You see, the wisdom Man's wisdom will eventually challenge God. But then it takes me to another story of a character in the Bible by the name of Solomon. Why? Because the Bible told us that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. In 1 Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 4, 
verse 28 to 30. So 29 to 30 says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceedingly much and largeness of heart, even as the sun that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom exceeded the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. But by the time you get to verse 34, it says, and, and they came of all the people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth which have heard of his wisdom. So imagine you had a man who was so wise. Why he was wise? Because he asked God for wisdom. People used to travel just to look and to hear this man speak. Just to hear this man speak. But I said to you, when wisdom, when man's wisdom excel, he'll only challenge God. In 2 second, in second Chronicles 9, verse 20, 22, it says, And King Solomon passes all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, if, if you want to test a man's character, give him power. You see, where did, where did Solomon get his power, his wisdom? From God. He asked God, and God blessed him with wisdom. But there's a next quotation here. It says, um, Lord, Lord Acton says, all power tends to corrupt, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. You see, it seems like man don't understand that there's a limit. So they will continue, and they will continue to push, they will push, they will push. But after you get above certain limit, you start to put your face in God's face. In First Kings eleven chapter, First uh, Kings chapter eleven verse three, it says Solomon had seven hundred wives of royal birth and three hundred concubines. But what happened? His wives led him astray. His wives led him astray. This is funny because Solomon was the wisest man. And he got his wisdom from God. <laughs> but you see, the point I'm trying to make, when man gets wisdom, he doesn't have a limit. And the next thing you'll see him do is going after God himself. Let's turn again to Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. And it reads, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittite, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Je Jebusites. Seven nations greater than and mightier than thou. Verse 2 says, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before you, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor so mercy unto them. Now this is a story coming, taken from when, when the children of Israel leave in Egypt to the promised land. Are you following me so far? Look at verse 3. This is what Solomon did not read. He says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughters shall not give unto his sons, nor 
his daughters shall you take unto your sons. Solomon asked God for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. But God also gave them this simple instruction. Do not marry to them. Don't have no covenant to them. And God tell him why. Listen what God said why. Deuteronomy 7, 4, he says, For they will turn away thy sons from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So Solomon had the instruction, and he also had the reason why you should not do it. If you do it, their daughters is going to lead you away from God. Lead you away. Next text. 1 Kings 11, 4, 4 to 8. It says, For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. You think he was, if he was wise and he was following the wisdom from God, that he would have done that? You see, after, after man start to understand wisdom and the power of wisdom, there is no limit. Man puts no limit on it. But after you continue, you're only going to go against God's authority. So I'll read again. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wife turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was his, the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zedonites, and after Milcon, the abomination of the Amalekites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. It continues, 1 Kings 11, verse 48. I'm still in it. Then, then did Solomon build a high place of Shemosh the abomination of the Moabite, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for the Mo Moed, the abomination of the children of Ammon. But isn't this the same people that God said don't have no covenant with? Verse 8 says, And likewise did he for all his exchanged wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. Solomon, do you know how many books of the Bible Solomon wrote? That's a question. How many books? I heard four. Solomon wrote three books. Three books. These three books are the three stages of Solomon's life. The first book was Proverbs. If you read the Proverbs, that's when Solomon was using God's wisdom. And he teached the people in Proverbs. His wisdom excelled among anyone else that was there. Then Solomon wrote the book of Songs of Solomon. This book of Songs of Solomon is when Solomon had all these wives. Matter of fact, for, for the young people that are quoting, if you ever want to have some words to, to exchange, read the book of Songs of Solomon. He was a really sharp boy. <laughs> he has words. Read the book of Solomon. But that's during the time that he was, he was foolish. Then 
he, he had one more book, and that's the book of Ecclesiastes. When Solomon came to his senses, when Solomon came to his senses when he was old, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, this, this is the book that I want us to, to, to pay a little attention to today. Book of Ecclesiastes. It only has 12 chapters. So we're looking at chapter 12. So here's wisdom from the wisest man who realized that he went down the wrong road. He says, remember now, Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1. He says, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in you. Now for some reason, for some reason, we learned this as Solomon was talking to young people. Maybe teenagers. That's how we learn it. But I'm putting it to you that Solomon was old, realizing that he has wasted a lot of years. So Solomon is saying in, in, in his early age, next slide, remember your creator before you get too old. You see, verse 2 continues by saying, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the cloud return after the rain. He continues in verse 3, he says, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong man shall bow themselves. This doesn't sound like he's talking to young people, like teenagers. But you see, Solomon, in his wisdom, realized that at his stage, where he starts experiencing some of these, he can now talk to younger people, not necessarily teenagers, but people like me and you, that has full strength. Why don't we remember God now that we can carry the gospel forward? Yes. Why don't we remember God now? Sometimes when the gates, the keepers of the gates gets weak and you start bending over, then is not the time to, to spread the gospel. Now is. Next slide, please. Verse 4 says, And the doors shall be shut in the street, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall raise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Similar to some of the things we're hearing now with, with elderly people, the noise bother them, they can't speak as loud as before, and, and even if they take a nap, they wake up so easily. Imagine Solomon is talking from the experience he's going through and saying to us today, I've wasted a lot of years. Remember your duty now. Remember your duty now. Verse 5 says, Also when they shall be afraid of which, that which is high, and, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper should be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to a long home, and the mourners go about the street. Solomon, he's a man of wisdom. Verse 6, as we continue, verse 6 continues saying, Or even the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Verse 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God. You see, what Solomon is saying, that don't allow the wisdom of this world 
to, to, to tie you up in your youthful days. That when you recognize that it's time to go home to meet your Lord or time to go from this life, that's when you're going to try to make it right with God. You see, in Matthew 28 has what we call the Great Commission to go and tell. All of us that, that decided to be a Christian, we always say, if, you, you, if you're a believer, you are a disciple. But yet, we wait until we're in this stage. And then says, let me try to do this. Or, or, or it's like, you want to do the most things when you're at that stage. But Solomon, the wisest man said, remember your creator in the days of your youth, in the days that you have your full strength. He continued by saying in verse 8, he says, all what I did was vanity. All what I did was vanity. All was vanity. And I, I, I can, I can, I don't want to put my neck on the block, but if you check your life right now, I believe you will come to the same conclusion that most of what you're doing in your life today is just vanity. It worth nothing. It means nothing. It's just for your own personal things. Don't wait until it's too late to say that my life was vanity. It worth nothing. In verse 13, he concludes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Rohan, for this beautiful, wonderful words today. And we will stand and sing together. I think this hymn is fitting to sing. Because we know that God is irreplaceable. Amen. There is nothing. God created this world. And there is nothing that can replace him. Even Google hymn 327 please pick up your hymnals and we'll sing this hymn together i'd rather have jesus than silver or gold i'd rather be his than have riches untold i'd rather have jesus than houses or lands i'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land I'd rather be led by his nailed pierced hands than to be world of fortitude. 
today I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy in the chorus again. Let the church say amen. You could do better than that. Thank you, Brother Rowan, for sharing the word with us today. Uh, he's not saying not to use technology. He's saying don't allow technology to rob you of the years that God can use you. And so to our young people, we have to find a way, since we're going to be on our phones. Sorry, not our phones, your phones. I'm not young anymore. But we have to find a way to use that phone, that laptop, that whatever it is, to bombard the world with Jesus as Google is trying to bombard us with information. We don't run from technology. We take it and we use it for God's glory. So thank you. It won't be 10 years um, for the next sermon. It might be sooner than that. And so reach across the pews if you don't mind. And while you're reaching, if you haven't said hello uh, to whoever, whoever it is that was sitting beside you. <laughs> we are a medium-sized church, thank you, with a big heart. And all we're trying to do is what? Move from pieces to peace. And how are we going to do that? By connecting people to God, our church, our community, and our world. And our worship to God does what? Allows us to support people wherever they are. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance on you both now and forever, let the church say amen and amen. Please wait for the deacons to usher you out. Have a good week. And listen, don't be...
beauty of our planet. A masterpiece crafted by the hands of the Creator. From the majestic peaks of snow-capped mountains to the gentle embrace of rolling hills, from the tranquil shores of glistening lakes to the rhythmic dance of cascading waterfalls, the Earth reveals the boundless wonders of its design. In the tapestry of existence, every thread tells the story of creation, of order, and of purpose. At this year's Earth Summit, themed Earth Hours to Care For, on April 28, 2024, at the International Center, we come together not just as stewards of the Earth, but as seekers of truth. At this summit, over 50 esteemed scientists will present compelling evidence of intelligent design, inviting us to explore the profound connections between science and faith. Various presenters and organizations will present tangible ways to lower our carbon footprints and maximize our positive impact on our planet and environment. The Earth Summit 2024 will be a journey of discovery, guided by both reason and reverence. It is a gathering of minds, hearts and spirits, united in a shared mission to celebrate the wonder of creation, to explore the mysteries of intelligent design, and to reaffirm our commitment to be faithful stewards of the Earth. The Earth is not ours to exploit, but rather a precious gift entrusted to our care. Through innovation, education, and compassionate action, we will honor the divine mandate to care for the Earth. Join us on this transformative journey on April 28 at the International Center as we celebrate the wonder of creation, embrace the call to stewardship, and embark on a shared mission to protect and preserve our precious planet. Earth Summit 2024. Earth, ours to care for. April 28, 2024, International Center, Mississauga. Free admission. Gates will open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Welcome to our Community Bulletin Board. Bendale community, are you in need? Can we support you? Look out for a team. That's right, the Shiloh Seventh-day Adventist Church Community Services Department will be in your neighborhood weekly on Saturdays with free bags of groceries while supplies last. So call and reserve your bag absolutely free, no questions asked. Pendale Community Grand Opening Coming soon for Shiloh Gym Services Very low rates for adults, youth and seniors It's time for change No more excuses Let's strive to improve our health Our clothing boutique is now open for adults and youth there is free clothing for all. You can also access our pantry. It's open on Thursdays and Saturdays. Food absolutely free for all. If you are interested in partnering with us, then please call us at 416-431-5048. Our nonprofit learning center offers many courses. Please reach out for further details. An open invitation is extended to one and all to join us for in-person Bible study weekly and Saturdays in our Shallow, here are your announcements for this week. 
It's income tax season and your income tax receipts are now available. They are ready for pickup. If you require your income tax receipts to be mailed out to you, then please notify the Treasury team. The Renew Prior Journey continues this Sunday at 6 a.m. Join us on Zoom or watch on YouTube. The Shiloh Music Department invites you to Jesus the Way, the Truth, and Life, Saturday, March 30th, starting at 11 a.m. See you there. Are you creative? Do you enjoy doing behind the scene work, editing videos and such? Then if that's you, you're exactly who we're looking for. Connect with us online or in person. Vacant posts. There's so many vacant posts. If you are available or interested in any of these posts, then please reach out to our clerk. Here are your birthday greetings for this week. Belated happy birthday to either B, March 20th. March 26th, Evelyn P. Melody T. March 27th, Camille A. March 28th, Cynthia B. Edney R. Tasha C. And William J. March 29th, Aaron C. Jeffrey W. Helvin C. And Michelle F. March 30th, Dora S. Celebrating anniversary. March 29th, Avis and her birthday. Celebrating your special moments, Shallow Theatres, Toronto.